So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the, sec the last half of our, or last fourth, I guess, of our, our conference. Um, this session, we have two really um, uh, important and wonderful speakers for you. Um, our first speaker is Andrea Radke Moss, who is a professor of history at Brigham Young, Idaho, um, where she specializes in women's history and religious contexts. Uh, she's the author of Bright Epic, uh, Women and Coeducation in American West. Um, and uh, she's published a variety of works on women in the Great Plains, uh, about Mormon women at the Chicago World's Fair, and women in higher education in the West. She's a contributor to the current volume Women of Faith series by Deseret Book. And she's a, a guest blogger at the Juvenile Dis Instructor. I almost said Juvenile Destructor, isn't that the Freudian slip there? Um, <laughs> and she's one of the most delightful people on the face of the earth. Um, Reed Nielsen is the managing director of church of the church history department at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, he oversees all the uh, department operations, including the church history library, the church history museum, and uh, the Granite Mountain Records Vault. They talk about sacred and secret. Um, <laughs> He's a graduate of Brigham Young University, uh, received a PhD in religious studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2006, and he's the award-winning author and editor of over 20 books and um, other works. Uh, he serves on the editorial boards of the Joseph Smith Papers Project and, and uh, the Deseret Book Company, um, and one of the most distinguished and wonderful people I know. So, uh, Andrea, and then, Read. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you can hear me okay. Oops. The Chicago World's Fair of 1893 marked a major crossroads for Mormon women, a seismic shifting, if you will, poised as they were exactly midpoint between the passage of the 1890 manifesto that ended polygamy for the church and the achievement of Utah statehood in 1896. Since the 1860s, federal anti-polygamy legislation had fed persecution and misunderstanding of the Utah church and had also resulted in numerous failed attempts by Utah to achieve statehood. The manifesto signaled the church's decision to eschew polygamous practice in favor of more acceptable monogamous marital patterns. So for some Mormon women, this boundary shift toward monogamous marriage also marked a new boundary for what it meant to be a representative Mormon woman. Utah's statehood was the ultimate reward for accepting federal authority, but also represented a major step for Utah's Mormon majority to prove their assimilation within American society. Significantly, Utah statehood also came with full suffrage rights for women, a move that surprised many who had viewed them as subjugated and degraded. <clears throat> Whoops. Make sure I've got the right. The challenge that lay before Mormon women during the exposition was to embrace what I call a shifting orthodoxy of Mormon womanhood. As the fair began, Mormon women were perceived at best as oddly religious and at worst as freakish curiosities who lived in harem-style marriages. In 1893, through a concerted de-emphasis on the peculiarity of polygamy and religious isolation, Mormon women sought to shed their lingering stereotype of oppressed plural wives, while also showing themselves as progressive women who would soon lead the way in a major state woman suffrage victory. As the boundary of representative Mormon womanhood shifted, Individual female leaders in the Relief Society and Young Ladies Mutual Improvement Association were thrust into the forefront of how the church portrayed itself in public. On Saturday, May 20th, 1893, while representing Utah Territory at the World's Congress of Representative Women, Mormon leader Emmeline B. Wells was invited to preside over the proceedings one, for one day. Considering how Americans had looked down upon the polygamous and culturally isolated Mormon women as objects of pity, and even contempt, Wells confided to her diary the appreciation of the significance of this invitation as, quote, an honor never before accorded to a Mormon woman, unquote. Indeed, Mormon women's presence at this fair was in itself a great achievement. 
However, she lamented, if one of our brethren had such a distinguished honor conferred upon them, it would have been heralded the country over and thought a great achievement, unquote. This comment noted her awareness of the existing gendered tensions in Mormon representation. Mormon women could be pitied, but Mormon men were absolutely hated. It also highlighted the central irony of the Chicago World's Columbian Exposition for the women who benefited from the unprecedented attention to women's rights and contributions that the fair offered, but who still found themselves excluded from the masculine achievements of the white city. Indeed, it was just this gender segregation that, per that permitted <clears throat> excuse me, that permitted Mormon women's presence at the fair to outshine Mormon men's that summer. Taking advantage of the various venues that the Columbian Exposition offered, the women's building, the Utah building, and here you have a group of representative polygamous Mormon women, <clears throat> Elizabeth Whitney, Emmeline B. Wells, and Eliza R. Snow. Taking advantage of the various venues that the Columbian Exposition offered, the Women's Building, seen here, the Utah Building, seen here, and the World's Congress of Representative Women, which would take place at the newly constructed Art Palace just up the road from the fairgrounds, that were held in conjunction with other pre-fair congresses. LDS women, like Wells, hoped to use these venues to fashion a new image for themselves as liberated representatives of a rapidly Americanizing church. And yet, Emmeline B. Wells was also a widowed polygamous wife, known for her marriage to Apostle Daniel H. Wells and her ongoing defense of both polygamy and suffrage in The Women's Exponent. Wells had long represented the public face of an older pioneer generation of Mormon women, those like Elizabeth Whitney and Eliza R. Snow, who had so long stood to demonstrate confident feminine faith and intelligence mixed with devout polygamous practice, a perplexing hybrid for both national suffrage critics and supporters. But Wells' appearance at the World's Fair marked a significant boundary transition for herself and other Mormon polygamous women who now found their earlier status as the face of Mormon womanhood somewhat eroded in favor of a new emerging image. By the time of Mormon women's formal connections to the national suffrage movement in the 1880s, a new crop of representative female faces was emerging to supplant the old. The Chicago World's Fair proffered these women an unparalleled public opportunity to assert their identity as modern women who are moral, progressive, patriotic, and monogamist, and who stood on the cutting edge of suffrage activism. Perhaps the most important new face of Mormon womanhood was Emily Sophia Tanner Richards. Born in 1850, the daughter of Nathan and Rachel Winter Smith, she married her childhood friend and sweetheart Franklin S. Richards, the son of Apostle Franklin D. Richards and Ogden Stake Relief Society president and suffrage activist Jane S. Richards. Emily was bright, thoughtful, social, and curious. At a young age, she was taught and mentored by Relief Society founder Sarah Granger Kimball, who was her school teacher. A relationship that would endure through their adult lives and help to form Emily's early suffrage sympathies. Besides her high connections to church leadership, her bright intellect, and her activism, Emily's most distinctive characteristic as a Mormon woman was that she was a monogamist. Her status as a non-plural wife and activist would become important as the LDS church transitioned out of polygamy into the 1880s and manifesto era. In 1882, Franklin and Emily were asked to join a community of expatriate Mormons in Washington, D.C. that included other mono another monogamous couple, John and Margaret Kane. Franklin Richards and John Cain in particular used their legal experience to defend the church against anti-polygamy legislation and the couples often met with high profile governmental leaders in an effort to improve Mormon relationships on a national level. That both couples were monogamous was consciously done and marked an important early boundary transition for the church's public relations efforts on the national stage. In the wake of anti-polygamy attacks on the church, the 1870-1887 Edmonds-Tucker Act and the rescinding of territorial women's suffrage, Utah suffragists ramped up their efforts. In 1888, Emily asked church leadership if she might form a Utah chapter of the National Suffrage Association. Building on the work of earlier polygamist suffragists, Emily catapulted her to leadership in the organization with her old monogamous companion from DC, Margaret Kane, as president, and Emily as delegate at large. Eventually with Sarah Granger Kimball and Brigham Young's daughter, Phoebe Young Beatty, as <clears throat> Jo excuse me, joining them in public territorial leadership. All four significant because they were all monogamously married. <clears throat> 
suffrage representation marked the first major boundary transition for Mormon, these Mormon women, perhaps to the overt formal exclusion of the older polygamous set. And by 1893, Emily was now poised to become the face of Mormon womanhood. Since Emily and other profile monogamous Mormon women did not leave diaries, it makes it very difficult to determine why or how these couples were able to stay out of plurality in spite of immense social and religious pressure for members of their elite class to embrace it as a marker of their social status, their religious devotion, and their commitment to the expectations of Mormonism's inner circle. Without these introspections, I as a historian am left wondering how they navigated this seemingly internal boundary almost certainly fraught with conflict and, and angst. Building on these efforts, the Mormon presence at the Chicago World's Fair was another opportunity for Mormon women leaders to present a public face that downplayed past polygamous practice and instead emphasized their image of assimilation and progressiveness. As part of this effort, female leaders in the Relief Society and the Young Ladies Mutual Improvement Association appeared before what were called the World's Congress of Representative Women for portraying a progressive face of Mormon womanhood. And yet, even with this formal showcase of female power and talent at the Chicago World's Fair, the representation of both groups exposed significant boundary tensions within Mormon female leadership, and that lay beneath the surface of all Mormon public relations efforts. On the one hand, the Relief Society leadership and representation, almost to a woman, and here, before I go into this, here you see a program from the Young Ladies um, MIA uh, program at the World's Congress. <clears throat> On the one hand, the Relief Society leadership and representation, almost to a woman, came from among a generation of prominent older suffrage leaders who all were or had been polygamous wives. And here you can see this list. Some of them known to you, Zina D.H. Young, a widowed polygamist, the widow of Brigham Young, Emmeline B. Wells, widow of Daniel H. Wells, Mrs. Electa Bullock, widowed, ironically, both Emmeline and Electa's husbands died within a week of each other in 1891. Mrs. Bathsheba Smith, widowed polygamist of George A. Smith, Martha Hughes Cannon, polygamist, Ellis Reynolds, ship polygamist, etc., etc. But for the young ladies MIA, notice the difference in age and either current or eventual marital status of the young ladies' presidency and board members. Now, Mrs. Elmine S. Taylor was a polygamous wife, and she was older. Mrs. Minnie J. Snow was a real polygamist, married 40 years, 40 years younger than her husband, Lorenzo Snow, when she was just a pup, and then um, this long-standing polygamous, polygamous family. But notice the rest of their counselors and board members here. Maria Y. Dougal. Monogamous, married in 1868. Mrs. Emily S. Richards, monogamous, married also in 1868. Martha H. Tingey, monogamous, married in 1884. May Booth Talmadge, James E. Talmadge's wife, married monogamously in 1888. Miss May Presson, who later married Oscar Moyle in 1895, who was, she was single at the time of the fair. Miss Laura Hyde, who later married Apostle Joseph Francis Merrill in 1898. And then other single sisters. So notice the generational boundaries here and the internal tensions going on as this transition for Mormon women is taking place. These younger monogamous, Emily S. Richards especially, had successfully achieved a boundary revolution, allowing fair attendees to view a consciously non-polygamous front of modern Mormonism, even as behind the scenes the church's ongoing struggle to transition out of plural marriage marked a fluid if not completely porous boundary. Note the reaction of journalists to Mormon women's presence at the fair. On June 18, 1893, Augusta Prescott of the Chicago Inter-Ocean announced to her readers, quote, Mormon women who will take part in the fair congresses are not polygamists. Reporting on the World's Congress of Representative Women, Prescott had met with May Wright Sewell, president of the World's Congress and also a friend of Emmeline Wells, and asked her to, quote, tell me something new and interesting about the work which is going on in Chicago for the benefit of women. Sewell chose to single out Mormon women's presence at the fair. Have you heard that we are to have Mormon women to take part in all our congresses this summer? Then perhaps disappointing the taste for the exotic, Sewell added, and do you know that these Mormon women represent some of the finest women's clubs and women organizations that are, be, that are to be found in America? Here Sewell reinforced the exact message that her Mormon friends had attended to the fair, intended for the fair, 
Not completely convinced, Prescott pressed further, inquiring, well, do you allow polygamists to address your meetings? And do you countenance polygamy in any of its forms, even though its representatives be pretty women and even club women and women suffragists? Why, no, said Mrs. Sewell. We do not countenance polygamy. We are spared the trouble of deciding whether we would allow it to be represented at our, at, at our congresses by the fact that none of the women who come to Chicago from Utah were of that belief, unquote. It seems unlikely that Sewell was not aware of the continuing polygamous sympathies and practice of many of her Mormon friends. Perhaps the statement, none of these women were of that belief, indicated an informal, rough association to the 1890 Manifesto, which allowed her an ambiguous but technically accurate defense of her Utah friends. But it also indicates the power to which Mormon women could affect such a publicity miracle, when some of them obviously still did believe in plural marriage. Upon further investigation, Prescott discovered more complexities of polygamy that while some kept their plural marriages, there are many, <clears throat> excuse me, there are many who belong to the Mormon church who have never liked the idea of taking several wives, unquote. Prescott described Mormon women as overwhelmingly relieved at the laws abolishing plural marriage and argued that they had only progressed and thrived since the abolition of polygamy. Her impressions of Utah women prior to the manifesto employed the exotic association of Turkish harems. Young girls were given no advantages at all. They were kept in great ignorance. They were scarcely sent to school, and girls were taught nothing at all. They were as ignorant as Turkish women or Japanese girls waiting for a sweetheart. But they had to work from morning until night, scrubbing, sweeping, baking, and sewing. So while the reporter recognized the progress of Mormon women as portrayed at the fair, she attributed entirely to them being free of the oppression of polygamy. Interesting that she failed to notice how grand advancements among women delegates could have been accomplished in a mere three years since the manifesto. Nor did she mention the extent of Utah women's suffrage, activism, charitable work, education, and journalism prior to 1890. But she admitted, all of the Mormon delegates are fine-looking women. They are becoming intelligent, and intelligence makes beauty. She seemed particularly smitten with Richards, an ardent woman suffrage who was interested in many forms of club and charitable work. Charitable work. And Mary Romney, um, seen here at the bottom of our list, who is, quote, determined never, no never, to be a polygamist, unquote. Mormon women's appearance at the fair highlighted a few significant representational shifts, both for the 1890s and for contemporary understandings of how lay and academic historians portray the character of female independence. How could Mormon, ma Mormon women manage to pull off a public relations coup, considering the vi visible presence of both known polygamists, albeit aging or, and or widowed, and monogamous women? While Mormon, women, while Mormon men were soundly rejected as purveyors of debauchery and authoritarian theocracy, Mormon women were welcomed as victims of that system and as willing symbols of women's attempts to rise above the abuses of plurality and patriarchy. Moreover, according to historian Reed Nielsen, professional relationship and personal friendships between Mormon and non-Mormon women seem to have made a major difference in the varied receptions." Unquote. While the Mormon male leadership had spent the 1880s in hiding and raging against anti-Mormon persecution, Mormon fe female leaders had been networking and enacting immensely successful outreach programs centered around suffrage. Still, even though this redefinition of the boundary of orthodox womanhood was at least temporarily successful for Mormon women at the fair, it could not be extended into another fraught area of boundary making, and that was in the representation of Mormons in general at the world's parliament of religions. <clears throat> Meant to be a non-denominational and interfaith celebration of religious diversity in the world, the parliament organizers still made conscious efforts at their own boundary maintenance in terms of what religions could be appropriately included in the parliament and which ones were excluded as non-religious. In early 1893, Mormon elder B.H. Roberts was denied in his request to present before the world's parliament of religions while many non-Christian traditions, even polygamous ones, were uh, excuse me, were represented as part of the Parliament's claim to embracing religious plurality. In spite of the Manifesto of 1890, Robert's unsuccessful bid for inclusion in the Parliament spoke to the gendered tensions in Mormonism's place on the margins of American society. Or, hearkening back to what Emmeline B. Wells had confessed to her diary, if one of our brethren had such a distinguished honor conferred upon them, it would have been heralded the country over and thought a great achievement." Unquote. Yet Robert's story contains its own contradictions since one Mormon actually did receive the participation that he was denied. So a significant missing piece to this story is our own Emily S. Richards, 
invited to speak before the women's branch of the parliament. The rebuff of Roberts by parliament leaders speaks to the gender dynamics of Mormon representation at the fair, since Mormon men could easily be blamed and shunned for the oppression that polygamy represented, while Mormon women could be absolved and welcomed as those who had risen above their marital subjugation. Indeed, history remembers that B.H. Roberts was snubbed, not that Emily S. Richards was allowed to speak. We know very little about the talk that Emily gave at the parliament. <clears throat> her eulogist at her funeral noted that she spoke on the women of Mormondom and organization, perhaps riffs on her speech that she gave at the, the uh, Congress of Representative Women. Then, recently, new information brought to my attention by John Silito in his signature book's publication of B.H. Roberts' diaries has significantly complicated our narrative about not only Emily S. Richards, but Mormon women's representation in the 19th century. In his diary, uh, Roberts notes on May 29th, some time ago I received a letter from the First Presidency asking me to prepare an article for Sister Emily S. Richards to read at the World's Fair in Chicago in September. I worked on this part of the day. Then on May 31st, he says, wrote up journal and wrote some on Emily Richards' paper. On June 2nd, in Salt Lake, worked on Richards' article. June 5th through the 7th, was about home and in town during these three, day, three days, attending to a variety of business, among them preparing article for religious congress at the World's Fair. June 9th, had John Whitaker typewrite article for World's Fair, which is nearly completed. June 12th, submitted World's Fair article to presidency. Joseph F. Smith was the only of the presidency there, but elders Franklin D. Richards and Francis M. Lyman of the Twelve were present. Article was satisfactory. June 21st, wrote letter to Sister Emily S. Richards, now at Chicago, respecting paper prepared for her, and forwarded the paper and letter to her. But learning that she would return, to, return soon held them. <clears throat> Richards, like other early Mormon suffragists, is used to represent a picture of Mormon women as independent, autonomous, and outspoken. This is borne up, of course, by the claims to Relief Society's independent organizational and financial functioning in the 19th century and affiliation with national and international groups. And yet, here we have an Emily S. Richards that is being effectively correlated by male church leadership, scripted to meet the needs of male general authorities. Was this an isolated event, or was it emblematic of a larger sublimation of Mormon women's voices to sublimate Mormon, uh, to sublimate Mormon women's voices to priesthood authoritative messaging and branding, even in the context of women's own activism. While Mormon feminists today are sometimes eager to mark early Mormon suffragists as feminist foremothers to later post-1960s incarnations of feminism, it is important to remember that Emily S. Richards' brand of 19th century feminism, like those of her contemporary Relief Society and Young Women's Leaders, was one that upheld the patriarchal structure upon which her life experience was formed, but did not challenge it and did not undermine it. Emily's goals were not incongruent with the larger church aims until they were. Suffrage activism, peace activism, progressivism, and social justice were all part of her feminism. Even her monogamy, though, and the internal and external uses of it for faithful boundary shifting showed how she had become the embodied public relations figure suited to the church's national needs. Was Emily Richards a self-actualized feminine authority, or was she a correlated puppet? The case of Emily S. Richards invites serious comparisons to the conditions of Mormon female representation today and of the orthodoxy of appropriate Mormon womanhood. We need only look ahead to the cases of later representations of Mormon females in the 20th century. Amy Brown Lyman, whose position as General Relief Society president was in part sacrificed because of her apostle husband's adultery, smacking of leftover polygamous inclinations that were potentially damaging to the church's mid-century public packaging both in terms of gender and marriage. Bell Spafford, an inheritor of the older progressive-oriented Relief Society, found herself caving to later correlation efforts with a brave and smiling face. And then at the peak of the ERA battles over the roles and face of Mormon women in the media, General Relief Society President Barbara B. Smith made two separate visits to Washington, D.C. to visit Presidents Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. Her visits served a significant purpose for the church and for a particular brand of Mormon womanhood poised as they were during a time of great contention over the Equal Rights Amendment. Representing the church in its anti-ERA stance, Smith could cast herself as an empowered and independent female leader, while also supporting the church's official position against federal equality legislation and in favor of traditional womanhood. And being received at the White House cemented her feminine authority on behalf of the church's male leadership. <clears throat> 
And now the tensions over female representation in the larger church have escalated by the demand for increased female visibility in the church, and yet those female representations are often trotted out in order to uphold the message that the church wants to portray. And except for some minor racially diverse exceptions like Sister Chieko Okazaki and Sylvia Allred, recent female church leadership has maintained a racially, socially, and economically homogeneous and very boundaried package. Today we've come full circle. At the recent World's Parliament of Religions held in Salt Lake City in October, there were no female representatives of the church that appeared at the parliament. Only Mormon elder L. Whitney Clayton, the highest ranking church official and one of its featured speakers addressed the church's parliament or to address the parliament. <clears throat> Still, the scarcity of female voices, even in this year's meeting, represents coming back to what Emily S. Richards represented at the world's parliament of religions, and that Mormon women are still not completely invited to the table, even in modern representations, even in demands for modern representations. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Andrea, for that presentation. I followed her work for many years at the work that she's done on the, both the World's Fair and, and other gendered conversations in the American West, very important conversations. I'd like to begin my remarks today by thanking the organizers of the conference, Brian and Boyd and Blair. It's sort of the three Bs that seem to always be pulling things together down here at UVU. You've always been so kind and considerate and inclusive in those that you invite to come here, and I appreciate that generosity and largesse. I've been thinking about uh, the paper that i am asked, been asked to give. This is on some research that I've done uh, over the past uh, many years, and uh, it's given me the opportunity to reflect on some earlier work and some conversations that I've been part of. I've been thinking about the title of the, of the symposium, Mormonism and the Art of Boundary Maintenance, negotiating identities in and around Mormonism. And I find it interesting that uh, perhaps this session is more about how Latter-day Saints have been drawn out of those boundaries, particularly in the larger Christian story in the Protestant establishment in North America. And so that's something that I'd like to look at in my paper today. And uh, Andrea has already touched on uh, a number of these themes to talk about the female experience there and touched a little bit on the male experience as well. In the story I'm about to tell, there are several major characters. There's B.H. Roberts, who you've heard a little bit about today. He was a member of the First Council of 70 at the time, known as Mormonism's blacksmith orator. He had a way with words and a way of pounding his points on opponent, his opponents particularly. There's also uh, a gentleman by the name of Charles Bonney, whose name you saw in a certificate here for the Women's Congress of Representative Women. He was the president of the entire 1893 Chicago World's Fair. And then I'll be talking about a gentleman by the name of John Burroughs, a very well-known Protestant preacher from the Chicago area who had a brother living in Salt Lake City who was part of the anti-Mormon crusade against plural marriage in the 1880s. We'll be talking about how these three figures and then one little sub-character by the name of Maurice Snell, a Catholic, who happened to be a secretary to the Parliament of Religions, how these four men interacted in and around Chicago and the fair. So with that, I'll begin. I believe we can learn a great deal about the prevailing Protestant establishment in Gilded Age America by analyzing which religious groups were barely represented or not exhibited at all at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and Parliament of Religions and by studying the reasons for their exclusion. In addition to the Latter-day Saints who received no invitation, Native Americans, African Americans were only represented a handful of 
in a handful of presentations during the entire Congress. And I'll try and uh, explain that a little bit more, what's going on, because not all invitations and participations were created equally. International exclusions included the so-called primitive religions, except for several paternalistic uh, papers on these tribal faiths offered by Euro-American attendees. Moreover, the religions of Africa and Latin America were barely exhibited at the parliament. Islam only had two representatives, and they were almost shut down midway through their speeches. But securing representation was only half the battle for these non-Christian delegates once they arrived in the White City, as Chicago or the fairgrounds were then known. Quote, the parliament was an aggressively Christian event born of American Protestant Christian confidence in its superiority and organized around unquestioned Christian assumptions of the nature and functions of religion, historian Judith Snodgrass explains. It was governed by a set of rules for controlling discourse so permeated with Christian presuppositions that they effectively reduced all other religions to inadequate attempts to express the Christian revelation. LDS representation was seemingly not wanted or largely solicited for Mormon men by the organizers of the 1893 parliament. My paper today on the study of Mormonism at the parliament, taken together with the experiences of other Latter-day Saints at the Chicago World's Fair, helps illuminate several larger issues. And it provides, I believe, religious studies scholars and historians with a rich case study demonstrating, in the words of historian Richard Seeger, quote, the ongoing process of revisioning religion in American history. B.H. Roberts and his fellow Latter-day Saints were denied the right to exhibit their faith in the main Columbus Hall. And I want to touch on what that means here in a moment. Because Protestant organizers determined that Mormonism did not qualify as a, quote, religion, largely on the grounds of its former practice of plural marriage. This helped set the stage to explain how and why LDS leaders subsequently attempted to exhibit Mormonism as an advanced cultural institution rather than focusing on its religious differences to the outside world. Now the parliament itself, how did it come to be? Desiring of, desirous of assembling the most inclusive body of religionists in the history of the world, the leader of the parliament, John Henry Barrows, committee mailed over 3,000 invitations to Christian and non-Christian religious leaders around the globe. Mormonism, however, was the single American religious group, as, in terms of its hierarchy, that was subsequently denied the promised hospitality from the beginning. Barrow's advisory committee never mailed a single invitation to the LDS church leaders in Utah. We'll talk about that. Nevertheless, after reading about the proposed religious congress in a newspaper, B.H. Roberts, one of Mormonism's most vocal and capable apologists, saw a unique public relations opportunity in Chicago. While working as the associate editor of the Salt Lake Herald, Roberts published an editorial in July 1891, suggesting that the LDS Church should lobby to become involved in both the Parliament of Religions and the overarching World's Columbian Exposition. He argued that the Chicago gathering might provide an unprecedented opportunity for followers of the church to showcase their history, theology, and cultural contributions in the national and international religious community. In hindsight, Roberts was naive, naively optimistic that a religious tradition like, our, like Mormonism, with its unique American religious uh, origins and history, quote, could not well be denied a hearing in its own behalf in the religious congress, unless indeed a narrow and most ungenerous prejudice should prevail in the councils of those having the arrangement and management of the congress, end of quote. Still he warned that, quote, if a sectarian bigoted prejudice should bar the Mormon church from a hearing in the congress, there is still the bar of public opinion in the world, end of quote. Now as we'll see today, and as you've already heard uh, partially, Events in September 1893 proved Roberts prophetic on both accounts. The church, as a formal organization, was denied a hearing at the parliament, and America's press proved to be an ally in shaping public opinion in its aftermath. Three months after Roberts issued his initial proposal in an October 1891 general conference meeting of male priesthood holders, 
He again tried to convince Mormon leaders and laity about the public relations opportunities that Chicago might afford. Because they had not yet received a formal invitation soliciting their contribution, his colleagues in the church hierarchy did not share his opinion and enthusiasm. So Roberts let another six months pass before he again lobbied for his losing cause. During the priesthood gathering of the, of the April 1892 General Conference, he again made it clear why, in his remarks, Latter-day Saints should not pass up this opportunity to represent themselves rather than being represented by others in Chicago. This time, church leaders reluctantly organized a group to consider Robert's proposal, but as often as the fate of causes consigned to committee study, nothing happened. However, once the Chicago World's Fair opened in May 1893, hundreds of Latter-day Saint fairgoers began to question the church's decision not to participate in its congresses. On July 10, 1893, Presidents Wilford Woodruff, George Buchanan, and Joseph F. Smith finally attempted to secure Latter-day Saint participation at the Parliament of Religions through a direct appeal to Bonnie. Quote, and I love the language they use here, we are given to understand that an invitation is extended to all denominations of Christians and to all the religions of the earth, quote, to air their beliefs in Chicago, their letter began. Quote, you will pardon our lack of information on the subject since none of the literature treating the movement has been forwarded to us. Of course, they knew full well that they had been slighted as they posted their letters to Chicago just two months before the parliament was to begin in the White City. Now, after waiting about 10 days for Bonnie's response, which never came, the First Presidency decided to send Roberts, who was chomping at the bit, to get out there for face-to-face -face meetings with the exposition and the Parliament's officials. When he arrived, he met with Charles uh, Carroll Bonney, who admitted to Roberts that he had not yet replied to the First Presidency's appeal and letter, and that the committee was conflicted about the proper response to the undesirable Latter-day Saints. But then Bonnie went on the offensive, cross-examining Roberts through a series of pointed questions. Quote, how would you answer the objection urged against the representation of your church in the parliament because of its belief and practice in polygamy? End of quote. Roberts replied that such objections should be ignored, pointing out that most of the Asian religions, including Hinduism, Islam, Confucianism, and Jain, uh, Judaism, and foreign nations represented at the parliament also practiced polygamy in the past or at least con uh, countenanced concubinage currently, yet they were not kept from addressing the parliament. If the organizing committee was willing to admit unchristian and unpolygamous religions from the east, they ought not to fear those who are considered unchristian and polygamous from the west, Roberts argued. He also pointed out that the church had officially begun the discontinuation of plural marriage three years previously in October 1890, rendering a, a moot concern I've often wondered how Roberts could say this with a, with a straight face, seeing that he was a practicing polygamist himself at this time in 1893. So Barrows, he decided that he promised the group that he'd bring it forward again to the organizing committee the following day. Roberts, uh, to his credit and to the consternation of parliament organizers, asked impetuously if he could be invited to be part of that conversation and be part of the deliberations of the committee. Of course, the committee said no and excused him. Well, Roberts wrote the report and then waited and waited. Nothing happened, so finally he returned back to Salt Lake City, frustrated that he had not secured the desired result for the First Presidency, representation by official members of the church hier male hierarchy there in Chicago. Opposition to the church's participation in the, parla uh, in the Parliament of Religions was not merely a grassroots campaign by low-level Parliament committee members. It was actually championed by the leaders' organizations. And I found as I dug into this, you look at the two main leaders, both had very strong feelings against the church. Charles Bonney himself was a Swedenborgian, and something that really affected his life was when members of his own family had been converted to the LDS church and were encouraged to leave the Chicago area and migrate west with the saints. He held a great grudge against the Latter-day Saints and was upset. John Barrows, on the other hand, was actively engaged in an anti-Mormon campaign with his brother in Salt Lake City who was helped leading, as I mentioned earlier, the crusade against polygamy in the Utah and the American West. He, in fact, had authored himself a number of anti-Mormon tracts which were distributed by Protestant uh, organizations uh, in defense of, of their doctrine 
and their feelings towards the Latter-day Saints. So both of them, both men who were the gatekeepers at this particular event, both the event uh, known as the Parliament and also the overarching Congress were against the Latter-day Saints in this setting. And as I look back, I have to admire Robert's, uh, his tenacity, it continued to move forward. He truly became a, a thorn in the side of both men and did very little to uh, change their opinions about the utility of working with and in concert uh, with members of the church. Well, finally, as things are going on, V.H. Roberts comes back out. It's about time for them to start the parliament. Only days earlier, he finally gets word that he will be allowed to speak. What's interesting about this particular moment, as I talk about in my larger study of the Latter-day Saint representation in the Chicago World's Fair, is that in the days and weeks leading up to the, the religion parliament, which comes at the very end of the Columbian Exposition, Latter-day Saints have an incredible opportunity and are embraced uh, as in ways they never had. More than 5,000 Latter-day Saints from Utah actually attend the parliaments. It's this excuse me, attend the larger congresses at the Columbian Exposition. It is the largest group of Latter-day Saints who crossed over the Mississippi going east versus west since the early days of the church uh, following the Nauvoo period. The fact that they had crossed the Mississippi and were re-engaging was a remarkable moment which many pointed out. The Utah Territorial State House that was on, rep, uh, that was on uh, exhibit here the, an image was shown a minute ago, was very well attended. People loved what the Latter-day Saints were doing uh, as American citizens, but they were very confused and frustrated with their religious beliefs. Again, much of it stemming from their belief and former practice and perhaps even continuing practice of plural marriage. Now something that really got up the ire of B.H. Roberts is when he arrived and came back for the parliament itself, still asking Barrows and Bonnie if they could participate, he was sidelined once again and had a conversation with a man, one of the characters I mentioned earlier, named Merwin Marie Snell, a Catholic, who was Barrow's personal secretary. And there's this wonderful moment when Roberts is sitting in his anteroom waiting for Barrow's to come out and answer his repeated request for representation of the parliament that uh, Marie Snell sets him down and says, I need to explain to you what's really going on in these committee meetings. I need you to appreciate the dynamics and the coalitions which are against you. And he said the following. Um, he diverged to Roberts how unfairly the Latter-day Saints had been treated in the private Congress committee meetings. As Roberts and Snell concluded their conversations, Barrows came through the door with several Asian Parliament delegates in tow. Unaware of Snell slamming uh, his damning disclosures, Barrows nevertheless declared that although he had not yet read Robert's paper on Mormonism, just like he'd prepared for Emily Richards, he had his own drafted set of remarks which were later published in full in the Improvement Era, which you can read there, which details many of these uh, events and currents. He was told that he would in fact be allowed to present after all. Well, finally, the Parliament of Religions opened to grant great fanfare on September 11th, 1893. This is what an, uh, a writer in the Deseret News had to say about that particular event. He said, an event of worldwide historic interest and one without previous counterpart in the history of the world took place here today. It was the assembling of the Parliament of Religion, a gathering of representatives of all the great faiths on the earth. And you saw the image earlier where you see the great uh, stage area with literally hundreds of, representation, uh, hundreds of representatives of the major religions of the world, particularly highlighted were those that were not wearing traditional Western dress, were mostly those from Asia and the, and the Orient, as they called it then, that had different religious clothing on that captured the attention of many of the other reporters. Now, as Roberts was sitting there, he was very concerned that all of the major religions had a chance to speak in that particular room. And so something I want to nuance a little bit, and I do it in my larger study, it's not the fact that Latter-day Saints were not allowed to speak in Chicago at the World's Fair. It was the fact that they were not allowed to speak in what they called the Columbus Hall. That's what Roberts was most frustrated about. In fact, in the coming days, Roberts was told he'd be allowed to speak, he'd be allowed to speak. Finally, because of uh, a conversation that was had on the public area with some Muslims about the practice of plural marriage, when a Muslim leader actually pointed out the hypocrisy of Christian Americans with their adultery versus the virtue of polygamy, in his words, 
They decided that at this point, no one else that practiced plural marriage or was associated would be allowed to speak in Columbus Hall. And at that point was when Roberts was actually taken down and not allowed to speak, which is a very important point. Roberts was so incensed because he was asked to speak in Hall 3, which was an ancillary, kind of a closet as he saw it. He said, Latter-day Saints either speak with the great religions of the world or we speak not at all. And Barrows, I'm sure, who but this time was so incredibly frustrated, said, great, then don't speak at all. Just leave us alone. Well, finally, the Parliament ended. Barrows gave a remarkable speech on uh, all the good that had happened at the Parliament and how so many different uh, churches were represented. And Roberts sat in the congregation or sat in the room and steamed. He was so upset, and as, as he promised earlier, that if the Latter-day Saints were sidetracked, as he accused Bonnie in a letter, and Borrows in a letter, that he would take it to the court of public opinion, which he did in successive days. There was a flurry of articles that appeared in the Chicago Inner Ocean, the Chicago Times, even appearing and syndicated across the nation in the New York Times and other places about the treatment of the Latter-day Saints at the Chicago World's Fair. Now I have to, uh, to smile because our friend Marie Snell, our Catholic uh, friend of, of Roberts, claimed that uh, the exclusion of Roberts was perhaps the greatest blot on the history of civilization of mankind. <laughs> I think that may be the uh, ultimate overstatement of, uh, of the century. Um, as I look back on this particular event, I think how frustrated both of these men must have been. One seeking representation of uh, a beleaguered faith, a minority faith, and the other trying to decide who was in and who was out and not wishing or desiring to have any embarrassment at the part of a parliament of religions. And clearly, at this time in American religious history, the Latter-day Saints were seen by many as an embarrassment on, uh, on the larger body of the American populace. Now, to conclude, everything wrapped up, as I mentioned, Roberts was able to take it to the court of public opinion, and there were a number of discussions which continued on, and Roberts, of course, wrote up his entire uh, experiences, as I, as I mentioned, in one of the Mormon periodicals. But it is interesting to see how religion was represented at the fair versus the way Latter-day Saints were able to represent themselves in full force as a cultural institution, as a territory part of the United States as people that are making important contributions to the life and society of America outside of their religious beliefs. So let me conclude with this thought. The disappointment that Latter-day Saint leaders felt after their religious tradition was sidelined at the parliament reinforced what most of them already suspected, that their critics in powerful places would continue to thwart their theological attempts into the larger Christian America. But in Chicago, they also came to appreciate that American Christians were willing to embrace the Latter-day Saints as cultural contributors. On the one hand, the territorial representatives from Utah, the women of Mormondom who did so well and had so, uh, such a, a podium and audience there in Chicago at the Art Institute, and the Tabernacle Choir, which took second place in the choral competition, enjoyed international acclaim and commendation. But on the other hand, Roberts and the church were ostracized by the Parliament of, Parliament of Religions organizing committee. Just after the men and women of Utah, especially the tabernacle singers, sparked on the world's cultural stage, the Mormon official, a male official to put emphasis there, was denied access to the globe's religious platform. And I argue in my larger study that juxtaposing, uh, juxtaposing these overlapping experiences help scholars better understand the limits of religious tolerance in the late 19th century America. Not only would the Protestant establishment continue to define the concept of, quote, religion, but it would also seek to control how minority American faiths, like Mormonism, publicly exhibited themselves to the world. Thank you.